All right. So next up, we have Katie Paxton Fear, who is going to be talking to us about bug bounties and lucky socks. I didn't even know lucky socks are a thing, so this is pretty exciting for me. Um, and of course, bug bounties are a very uh, important topic to a lot of us right now, and a growing of gro growing importance to all of us, blue team, red team alike. So very excited for this talk, uh, Katie. Over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so. Today I'm going to be giving two talks which are very closely interlinked and you might be surprised by this, but if you happen to be somebody who follows me, you're maybe not as surprised as it may at first initially seem. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is introduce myself because as you watch enough conference presentations, you deliver enough of them, uh, the first thing you have to prove is not your ideas, but in fact you're worth listening to. So. My name is Katie. Um, I'm also called Insider PhD. Um, I'm a lecturer in cybersecurity at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, but I'm sure none of you know me because I'm a lecturer at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm sure most other people know about one of my many hobbies. Now, I'm sure you're actually well known. Uh, you know me just because of my knitting, but I'm sure you might have also perhaps heard uh, about my bug bounty hunting. So I do bug bounties as a hobby, right? I indulge on them on my evenings and weekends. And I also make a lot of YouTube videos talking about bugs and how to find them. I've found about 30 valid vulnerabilities so far. I started in June, 2019. Um, and I found bugs in organizations that range from the US Department of Defense to Uber, to Verizon. So really a full spectrum of different companies. And I wanted to start this presentation by really giving the story of my first bug. Um, and this is definitely me when I found my first bug, for sure. Uh, so I was invited, I was very fortunate to be invited uh, as a uh, mentee at a HackerOne Live event. And when I was there, I found my first two bugs and I earned about 1K. It's not a huge amount of money, certainly not for like a lot of tech people, uh, but for me, it was a lot of money. And I went, to, I left that event thinking I'd never done any kind of penetration testing. I actually um, could have done security at university, but turned it down because I thought security sounds really hard. I don't want to do that. Um, but I was like kind of bullied into going to this uh, live event. Um, and I was like, right, that's it. I'm bad at this. This was a complete fluke. This is never happening again. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be invited back uh, to another live event. Uh, during DEF CON and I thought well I'm based in the UK that's a free trip over to Vegas during DEF CON okay I might be bad at it but I'm certainly going to take advantage of this uh, and I found two more bugs while I was there now as a previous life after I finished university I went off in the world and I was a data scientist for a bit and I found two more bugs while I was there and my inner data scientist was like yep there's a trend there uh, that is you know, two attempts and four valid vulnerabilities, like that, that's pretty, working pretty good. And as I'm sitting here counting all of my money, um, I'm spent it all on yarn. I went to one yarn shop and I spent so much money on yarn. You would not believe how much yarn costs when you have $1,000 in your pocket, roughly the same. Um, I haven't even used that yarn either. It's kind of special to me now. It's like my very first bounty yarn, um, but, I did I did try and spend it all on uh, on um, on yarn. Um, so if you're not familiar with the concept, because not everybody is, what is bug bounties? Now, in a nutshell, it's freelance cybersecurity. Bug hunters are freelance cybersecurity experts who find security vulnerabilities in other people's products and services. Instead of a penetration test where you pay for an engagement with a bug bounty hunter, you as an organization pay per valid bug. You pay get paid for vulnerability found and the higher the risk for the vulnerability, so the higher impact it has, the more devastation, the scarier it is, the higher the reward. And rewards can really vary. Like they can go from like $100 to $100,000. Like the spectrum is huge. And you hear people like me talking about how they spent all of their money on yarn. And you hear other people who've done up an entire kitchen. So they really do vary. And it's primarily about risk, right? So the idea is, is that if you pay a bug bounty hunter a lot of money, they'll be more kind of uh, interested in hacking you and you finding out about it than uh, one of the bad guys, essentially. 
uh, who might be more interested in making money off of you than taking your money from you. But this kind of all rolls into kind of one idea, which is what is a bug? So when we think about bugs in software, we're actually often thinking of like software issues, like very much a case of, um, oh, there's a bug in this piece of software and it crashed. But actually, when we talk about it in the terms of bug bounty hunting, um, software crashing is not that much of an issue and you're not going to be paid $100,000 for that. What you're actually going to get paid is nothing. <laughs> you'll get a very nice email saying, thank you, but that's not on the developer roadmap this quarter. But what a, when we talk about bug bounty hunting, what we're actually talking about is security vulnerabilities. So these aren't just like regular software issues. These are regular software issues which have a security impact. Now that impact might be really, really small. That impact might be, oh, if an attacker was to exploit this, they could um, like update your social media profile without you knowing. Um, versus like some exploits, which can be something like, you know, if someone was to exploit this, they could take all of your data. Um, and really what makes bug bound hunting perhaps a bit different from other kinds of penetration testing is that you can't, in bug bounty hunting, you can't just find the bugs. You have to show you can exploit them and actually play that role of an, a potential attacker. And primarily when you think about like, why am I paying all of this money to have someone penetrate, penetration, do a deliver a presentation test, but online? Um, actually what you're paying for is the exploitation step. And what people are paying for is being scared. Um, but not in the kind of ransom approach of being scared, but in the kind of, that's a super, super spooky vulnerability, let's maybe not leave that in any more than it has, than it is already been in there for several years and we've not noticed. And this is what makes bug bounty hunting challenging. It is the exploitation of a bug, not just the finding of one. So this all kind of rolls together being like, is that legal? Are you sure that's legal? Are you positive that's legal? Um, and the answer is yes. So bug bounty hunting is 100% legal, comma, as long as you follow the rules of engagement. We have rules. You can't just start hacking random companies. Like, do not do that. I'm explicitly telling you not to do that. Like, don't do that. Don't touch them. Don't get curious. Don't, oh, I'll just try. No, just leave websites alone unless you are following the rules of engage engagement. And what we'll see here is that if you're not sure, um, there are programs that have listed on their page and website that says very clearly, here are the, um, the rules, please don't break them. Now, the other thing from this is like, okay, what about um, kind of more broadly, legally speaking, things like, at least in the UK, the Computer Misuse Act, in the US, like the uh, Computer Fraud Act. So, the way these legal definitions often work is they have this idea of permission associated with them. So if you are following the rules and you're not breaking the rules and you are listening to people and you're not being bad, um, you have permission to do this. There's not a case that is like, you don't have permission, you will have permission to do this. And on top of that, programs then guarantee something called safe harbor, which is the idea that says, hey, even if you were to do something bad, um, we're not going to prosecute as long as you follow these rules of engagement. And again, follow the rules. Katie is not saying hack random companies. Katie is saying follow the rules. And I have to stress this because what tends to happen when I deliver these kind of talks is people get really excited about what they can do with this and really curious and then start touching things. And you're not supposed to touch things. <laughs> Don't touch things unless you have permission to touch them. With that in mind, if you would like permission to touch them, um, often uh, these bug bounty programs are run by bug bounty platforms, or at least on them. Now, there are third parties in this. So you have your target, you have you, the hacker, and then in between, you have the platform. Now, you might be thinking, but why? And platforms offer um, a few kind of useful services. So on one side, they offer things like triage services. They also offer kind of smaller scopes. So let's say you're a company and you say, well, our infrastructure can't really support um, like the entire internet hacking this. Um, let's do that to say 50 people <laughs> to start with um, while we get kind of our infrastructure up and running. So that's one thing they do. 
on the on the hacker side they're basically like a one-stop shop you know they let you kind of sign up for one account and hack a bunch of different companies you're not necessarily limited to like you know just following say facebook's program right you also have all these other options um and other things they do is they coordinate things like payments so if you say want to be paid in cryptocurrency um then you would want one that supports cryptocurrency it's that's just how they tend to work um, and there's a bunch of them. So you have Integrity, HackerOne, BugCrowd, Synac, Yes, We Hacked, ZeroCop, The Detectify, and more I've forgotten um, because I don't remember all of them. The two big ones are HackerOne and BugCrowd, by far like the larger um, kind of two websites. Uh, Integrity, Synac have much smaller programs, but actually they offer kind of more specialist uh, kind of options. So like for Integrity, they offer a lot of European stuff. So uh, especially they focus on the Benelux area, so Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, uh, those kind, that kind of area. Um, and Detectify is kind of unique as well, because what you do with them is you sign up to um, hunt for bugs, but actually that gets powered, that goes on to power an automated scanner. It's a bit weird, but that's kind of, they're all a bit different. If you're not sure and you're like, this sounds kind of interesting, would like to have a go, Hacker One or Bug Crowd are by far the two easiest ones to get started with. But how do you decide on Hacker One or Bug Crowd? Well, um, this is when we get to who you can hack. Now, there are a lot of options in who you can hack. So you have the US Air Force, Etsy, Uber, Verizon, GitHub, PayPal, MasterCard, Nintendo, Goldman Sachs. So you can see it's actually quite a wide range of organizations there. Some things we think of kind of newer technologies, Uber, Spotify, Twitter. We then have kind of more corporate um things like verizon hp we also have like specialist stuff nintendo tesla where you have video games uh, and cars you also have financial institutions mastercard and paypal you can see it's really quite a broad range of like choices in target and then depending on kind of what targets you're interested in um you then choose a website so if you want to hack etsy you have to go on bug crowd if you want to hack github you've got to go on hacker one it's just how they work now, these aren't the only choices you have, but I'll talk about that in a second. Most people don't actually like limit themselves to one platform. It turns out you can just sign up anywhere. You don't actually like, there's no um, loyalty program for staying on a certain platform. Most people join all of them and then pick something that interests them. It's really quite straightforward for them. Now you don't need to use a bug bounty platform. So many companies run external bug bounty programs. Facebook and Microsoft are the two big ones. Even small companies may reward a, a bounty for disclosing vulnerability, even if they don't have a bug bounty program. However, this can result in legal action. This can result in people being very unfriendly. Um, this, they are not obliged to pay you at all. Um, and what you might be doing is extorting them. So not only will you get in legal problems for, you know, breaking the Computer Misuse Act, breaking the Computer Fraud Act, um, you might also be breaking extortion laws. So my recommendation is don't do that. Um, one really cool thing that's happening is um, some open source projects may have bug bounties available. Um, quite a few will offer kind of bounties as part of like a larger program. It's kind of neat if you want to care if you care more about like open source side of things now you're probably listening to all of this and thinking yeah but what are you actually doing <laughs> you're getting paid money for this what are you doing what is your job actually um so to kind of borrow uh, a bit of an analogy from the the previous presenter that was not planned but uh i'm very hungry um we have ingredients so we need burp sweet or owas zap so they're both proxies. Don't worry, I'll talk to you about those in a bit. Um, we need a target. So we just talked about how to find a target and some knowledge about bug hunting, specifically what bugs are out there exactly. What am I looking for? And the general recipe is, you know, hack them, whatever that means, write the report and then finally get paid at the end. So with that in mind, um, how to get into bug bounty. So in short, what do you need to learn? Now I'm kind of describe it as these five steps. Um, of course, indexes all start at zero. So step zero is learn how the web works. Now, quite often people will jump straight up into like 
exploiting bugs without really understanding the underlying technology of how the internet works. Um, and that can mean that you start to get in a position where you don't really know what you're doing and you might accidentally um, cause either unintended harm or you might think you've got a bug, but actually what you found is just how the internet works. Uh, the next step is really uh, how to use burp slash zap. So how to use the tools of the trade. Uh, next one is what bugs are actually out there. And then really the next one is kind of the both interlinked, which is how to exploit them. And this fourth step here is to practice exploiting them. So, you know, it's not just the kind of knowing what's out there. It's also getting that kind of exploitation step and also practicing it. So with that in mind, how does the internet work? And I took a networking course when I was doing my undergraduate degree. I have an undergraduate in computer science. And I had a networking course and I went to all of my lectures uh, like a good student because I'm a nerd. And I couldn't help but think that the internet is magical and shouldn't exist. And if you learn networking and don't come out with that kind of um, uh, like result of being like the internet should not exist, how does this work? This is sorcery. I think something has gone wrong in your education. <laughs> um, the internet is actually really complex and that's good in terms of being a bug bounty hunter because there's quite a lot of things the internet wasn't built for that we use it for. So a really like good example here is the fact that HTTP by default is stateless. So it doesn't care who you are from like one website to another page on the website. Like it doesn't care who you are. It doesn't know who you are. But we went and invented logging in, um, which means that that then wasn't going to work. And then we had to invent cookies to do that. Unfortunately, then cookies then led to things like cross-site scripting and the ability to steal cookies. Um, when we then start going, well, we'll make some cookies secure. Um, so it's less of an issue, you then have on top of that, oh, well, that's fine, we'll just use um, a vulnerability called CSRF in order to do the same thing and steal your account. And you go, well, actually, we've invented another cookie to solve that problem. And you end up realizing that the internet is quite literally like built like a, a house of paper cards and you're sitting there blowing on it. Um, but that's the first thing to learn. Like I would say your bare minimum to start with is what a request is, what a response is, and what the difference between the two are. The next kind of thing here is then uh, using Zap or Burp. Now they're both do the same thing. They're proxies. Now you might be more familiar with proxies as in like what you used at school to get around like your school's firewalls to stop you from looking at stuff on the internet you shouldn't have been, like playing games all day. Um, but actually what these do is they sit between like your computer and the internet and we'll show you what your computer is doing. Like, you know, we load up a website and we've never seen a request. We never know what a response is. We don't know that there's actual text that's being sent. And I've been a web developer since I was about 13. I was very into Neopets as a child. Super, like, got into computers at a really young age. Started programming at a super young age. It was until June 2019. Um, so when I was 25, 26, that I'd ever seen a request before <laughs> or a response and seen what they look like, like with the headers and everything. Um, but this is what they do. They sit in between. And what we want to do as a bug bounty hunter is touch them. Like we want to start fiddling with all of the little things in here to try and make it do something it shouldn't do. So if we see an ID, we want to change it. We see a number, we want to make it negative. We see, you know, um, like any other values, we want to start playing with them. Now, what bugs are out there? So most people will give you the OWASP top 10 list. If you know the OWASP top 10, you will realize this is not the OWASP top 10. And you'd be correct. This is Hacker One's top 10. Now, the reason why there's a slight difference is because what actually gets found and what OWASP tells you are out there is quite different. Um, but the kind of key issues are things like cross-site scripting, the ability to inject JavaScript into a page, improper authentication, so not logging in correctly, information disclosure, so being able to access something you shouldn't, you know, secret file.txt is available publicly on the web, privilege escalation, turning your low-level account to an administrator, SQL injection or SQL injection, which is um, being able to inject database commands into the database, code injection, so the ability to inject raw code and have it return something. Primarily, this is things like shells. Server-side request forgery, or SSRF, which is um, this idea of using the web page as a kind of 
door into internal networks. Insecure direct object reference, or sometimes called, um, uh, oh God, broken object level authorization, um, which mean the same thing, which is that you have an ID uh, and you can access a resource that isn't yours by the ID. Improper access control, same kind of idea. And CSRF, which is um, client side request forgery, which is abusing the way your browser handles cookies in order to do something on your account without you knowing. Hey, do you so, need to be yeah. sharing slides right now? Yeah, I should be sharing slides, am I not? You are not sharing them on the Zoom. I didn't want to interrupt no. you because you're rocking and rolling. Sorry. My bad. It's Hopefully quite right. I can now fix this problem. Looks good. Are we good now? Perfect. Okay, excellent. No, that's fine. I don't know how to use a computer. I just broke them. And evidently this also extends to Zoom. Um, so it's fine. Uh, so what should I actually learn? So I've stolen some data here from someone who isn't me, um, which is the same list, but now instead of like organized by um, most common vulnerabilities, it also now shows the year on year growth. Now, why is that important? Well, because you may have realized, if, especially if you're in security, that um, things like S2 injection are not as popular as they used to be, um, just because people are now a bit more aware of how to stop them. You're very rarely going to get an SQL injection, which is just one equals equals one uh, dash dash anymore. Like it's just not going to be the case. They're far more specific. Now, what we really want is the um, bugs you want to find are ones that are most common and also are not currently reducing. So for example, cross-site request forgery, CSRF is actually going down because um, with uh, like the way the browsers are currently changing how cookies work, which is same site by default, um, they're just changed it now. So really what I'd like to take away from this is what's actually worth learning. So first is information disclosure. Second one is access control. Third one is IDOS. And the final one is XSS. They're a really good place to start out. If you are curious about learning this more, I have an entire YouTube channel that talks all about them and all of their little intricacies. Um, and the next thing I mentioned was, you know, how to exploit them. So we have securitycreators.video and there's a bunch of people who also make YouTube content. So I can't be ever accused of, um, you know, self-promotion if I also promote other people as well. My name's also on this list and you should definitely subscribe to my content. <laughs> um, so one other way I really like to do it is write up. So listening to how other people like figured this stuff out can be really helpful in um, working out how you can exploit things in the future. There's also disclosed reports. So both HackerOne and BugCrowd just disclosed reports publicly. You can go ahead and read them. People also often suggest courses. I don't really like courses because I think um, with bug bounties, most people think they're going to become millionaires and then spend money they don't have to become millionaires. And I just don't think that's very good to recommend. So I'm not going to recommend courses, but I am going to recommend the multitude of free resources out there. And that goes as well for practice. So I really like like some of the free resources, the Web Security Academy by Portswigger there who make burp. Um, they do like a bunch of labs on all kinds of like vulnerabilities. We have the Hacker 101 CTF by Hacker One, which is published by Hacker One, of course. Um, and honestly, there's so many like web-based CTFs out there. Like, this, I can't make like one recommendation and go, "Here is everything you need." And now you can go off and um, just sort it out yourself. You now know. Um, I think that it's really good to get a bunch of different practices. My favorite way of practicing is to actually hack something. I think by the time you're listening to me talking, you knew more, you know, more listening to me than I did when I first started. So I can only imagine that's repeatable. Uh, and this, I recommend some paid resources here. So try Hack Me, Pentester Lab Pro, Bug Bounty Hunter, same kind of idea, you just pay for it. Um, but, you know, maybe don't start out by paying for things. Maybe just start out seeing whether or not you like it, then decide if you want to pay for it. So let's talk about luck versus skill. Now, I'm going to tell you something most people don't tell you, which is that bug bounty is partly luck. 
to find bugs and especially to find them well, it's a combination of skill and luck. Now, when you first start out, you're probably looking at like 80% luck, 20% skill. And as you improve, your skill becomes more of a factor and luck less of a factor. And what pros really, like the people who make literally millions have found out, is they've developed specialities of things they're good at. So when you first start out, it can very much feel like you versus the person they tell you not to worry about meme. But actually, when you get first start out, you can actually find more than you think you do. Um, but let's talk about turning the tide in our favor. So quite often people will tell you, go for a public program, go for a, a public, a private program. If you're really worried, you can go for a private program. If you sign up to Hacker 101 and you do some of the CTF, not only will you learn something, but you will also then get private invites. So you can start actually hacking. We also have industries. So any industry, if you've already used an application, that is a huge like thing to start out with. Um, what asset to hack? Mobile apps. Most people don't hack mobile apps. But I'm going to be honest with you and tell you my secret because my secret is the socks. It's the socks. It's definitely the socks. I always find bugs when I wear socks. Of course, I never don't wear socks to hunt bugs because why would I do that? That's not very lucky. Um, these things are obviously not related at all. And it's really the socks which are doing things. So what makes a lucky sock lucky? Um, well, it is making them yourself by your own two hands with string and needles. Yes, if you watch my YouTube videos and listen to some of my other talks, you will now have a live demo. Unfortunately, the live demo wasn't in the part of the, the presentation you perhaps expected it to be in this time. So let's talk about making your own lucky socks and how you can do it. So knitting in a nutshell. So knitting is the act of turning string. So we call it yarn. That's yarn, not wool. In the UK, people often call it wool, but it is, uh, it is just called yarn. And it can be made out of lots of materials, not just wool. Now, we use our knitting needles. So these things, they're not very sharp. Like they're very much like not, not very sharp at all. Um, and we turn yarn and we do it into stuff. And how do we do that? Well, we do loops. So we have loops and we have loops and then we have loops and there's a lot of loops. Now in knitting, you have two main stitches. So the first one is called the knit stitch. And the second one is called the purl stitch. Now, the important thing is that um, the, sorry, this is the live demo part. Um, so the pearl stitch is basically the back of a knit, knit stitch. You're just gonna have to live with it while I, before I get my live demo done. Um, and we can knit either something flat, which is where you often see like my two needles here are connected with a cable. Um, but quite often, if you've ever seen like knitting as like, on television, they're two giant straight needles um, and that's knitting flat. I'm going to show you how to knit in the round because obviously socks are not flat. And we either measure knitting needles in millimeters, so that's European sizes, or US sizes, um, which are kind of just arbitrary. And uh, here are the two different knitting needle types. So on the one side you have um, the cable, needles with a cable, so this is knitting in the round. Um, and you also have the, the, the straight needles. There's also other types of knitting needles. I'm not gonna to go too much into them, but we also have double pointed needles, which if you've ever watched somebody knit with DPNs, you will know it looks like absolute wizardry because this is a person that have an octopus of sharp things pointing out at you. It's like, don't mess with them. And I'm also gonna recommend a website called Ravelry. Now Ravelry has not been doing great things. I'm not gonna get into the knitting community's multitude of drama, but, Twitter for knitters. So Ravelry is a great place to get signed up to if you're interested in learning knitting or crochet, um, because it literally has every single pattern. You can have patterns, you can search for patterns, you can like then post your progress of patterns, and then you can see all of um, the patterns. However, comma, if you have any kind of seizure or migraine disorders, I would look into the alternatives for viewing the website because some people have found that it gives them migraines um, because they've made some very questionable design choices in the past few weeks. So let's talk about what you'll need to get started. 
So if you want to make socks, which I'm assuming you do, um, you will either need a US size one needle. So to give you a, a kind of example, this I think is a US size five. Yeah, this is a US size five. Um, and US size one looks like uh, like very thin. It's like toothpicks. I should have really brought one over with me. And I recommend you get started with one with a cable attached to it. Um, and you need to get, have at least a 32 inch cable. If you are in the EU, the size you need is 2.25 millimeters. And you also need some fingering weight yarn. Oh, actually I had some information about that. So you need to look for a mix of 75% um, wool and 25% nylon. The nylon gives the sock strength. Good vegan options, cotton and bamboo. Um, and you can see here, this is an example of, uh, of like what it looks like. If you want thicker socks, um, US size five for DK weight yarn. So this is the kind of, this is DK weight yarn. It's not like super thin, um, but it's it's a bit thicker. Or US six, if you're in the US, you'll find, probably find you can find worsted or a DK and worsted weight ball of yarn. Now, if you're thinking, okay, where do I actually buy this stuff? Yarn.com, if you're in the US. Um, Nitpicks as well, if you're in the US. Though I understand Nitpicks are having some supply issues at the moment, so you may want to consider that. Um, Wool Warehouse, if you're in the UK. Um, and Demora's, which is both UK and US. Um, but I'm going to recommend your local yarn store. The pandemic has pretty much ruined a lot of people's um, businesses, and actually, your local yarn store was probably already struggling. As a bonus, your local yarn should store will have literal experts there willing to come and help you with your projects because they desperately want more people to be interested in knitting. And give you an idea of how common they are, this is a very zoomed out, <laughs> very zoomed out picture of the UK, um, but you can probably find one within an hour of where you live usually. If you're outside of a major city, this is a bit harder, but you'd be surprised. Like one thing I'd love doing is whenever I go abroad, I always go and visit a local yarn shop. And I've been abroad a few times and I've managed to find local yarn shops most times. So with that in mind, how much does it cost to get started with knitting? $12? If you'd like to anyway. Um, but that is like, I just wanted to show that as much as I'm saying that I just had to, you know, start doing bug bounty hunting in order to pay for yarn, for most people, it's not actually that expensive. Um, I have expensive tastes, but you certainly don't have to start out with paying for like 20 pound balls of yarn and buying enough to make a jumper when you're like an XL size. Like it is very much that you can start out with just the basics and then upgrade if you find you actually like it. Now the anatomy of a sock. So socks, this is a pair of socks that I made. Um, and I think it's kind of nice because it shows the anatomy of a sock. So with the method I'm going to be showing, because I'm literally live demo, um, I'm not going to knit an entire sock. That takes a long time. Uh, part of the reason why it's lucky is because you put so many hours of work into it, much like bug bounty hunting. Um, so we start at the toe and then we knit a tube until we get to the heel. And then we knit another tube until we get to the cuff. Very straightforward. The majority of the hard part in socks, if I just... Uh, Give myself a little laser pointer here. The heel is the hardest part of making a sock because problem is a heel is a toe, but in the middle of a sock and on the wrong wrong kind of side when you're knitting it. So the heel is the hardest part. Now, the nice thing about sock knitting is that you can kind of mix and match. So you can start out with your heel or so you start with your toe. And if you have like a large toe or a small toe, you can adjust for that. If you go to a heel and find that heel doesn't quite fit you very well. My partner has size 13 feet. Um, he has a huge heel and this method does not work for his feet, but it's fine because all I do is replace it with a different method of, of knitting a, a heel. And then the tubes is just as long as you want to make them. Like if you want, if you have long feet, you just make it as long as you need, right? Like one of the main advantages of knitting, especially if you li live outside of like, the norms in terms of foot size, you just make it whatever size works for you. And then we have the cuff at the top. And for the most part from like this point, it's plain sailing. Majority of knitting for a sock is knitting um, a giant tube. Right, let me give you some numbers because as they think knitters love more, it's maths. Um, here are some numbers to start with if you wanna get started with sock knitting. Um, my recommendation is to knit an adult medium. 
uh, even for my partner's size 13 feet, um, a medium uh, fits in pie. And for me, a medium fits me fine. So I don't know what that kind of sorcery is, but knitting stretches more um, lengthways than it does up and down. Next step is to make a fake foot. So you, to make a fake foot, you draw around your foot and cut it out. And you'll use that to check the size. One thing I do is whenever I knit for people, I ask, hey, can I take can I take a fake foot? <laughs> Sounds really weird, is really weird. Uh, it's not as hard as it seems. And what you do is just periodically as you make the sock, you just check. OK, right. Slide over. Let the knitting begin. OK, so I'm going to try. I, by the way, I have not properly like I have not properly tested this, but hopefully. Okay. Right, when we're we're knitting. Okay. So apologies, it's my PhD thesis in the uh, top of the screen there. To cast on with knitting, you get your ridiculously long needles, like the, the cable is pretty long. And you have two needles like this, and you hold them like that. All you need to do is you hold the yarn like this. So you kind of see how I'm holding it. I'm holding it like a Y shape. Um, and all you do is you place your first needle like this. So slip that on, twist it at the bottom, put it on that one, hold it there with one finger like that and twist it again. Twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it. And this is basically how you start. And what this does, is it means at the very top, these two like areas are very much connected. And like that is the very tip of your of your sock. So you cast on however many stitches you need according to the stitch numbers. And you make sure the same amount of stitches on both needles. Cool. So now you just hold it like this. So make sure it doesn't fall off. Pull out this needle like so. And now you're ready to start knitting. So for the first thing we knit through the back loop. So I'm really sorry, I should have probably got chunky yarn for this, but we knit like this, hold our yarn, wrap it around, pull this knitting needle out and let that stitch off the needle. So go in through the back, wrap it around and then just catch it like this. So what I've done is I've kind of caught the um, the yarn with my hand and this looks like I'm doing wizardry right now and I know it looks like I'm doing wizardry um, because I just remember seeing people knit for the first time and thinking wow you're magic um, but actually it just takes practice and it goes into your working memory like like just sorry your muscle memory super quickly. Now once we're done all we do is we put this the all the stitches back by pulling on the cable to get them back on the needles like so and then so we're in this position we take this one here and we go back in again and then like so so we carry on going all the way and one thing to note is that I'm using metal needles here. Uh, metal needles are very slippery because I have good control over the stitches. Don't start with metal needles. They're really hard to use to start with. So go into that and again, tell it out. And as you can see, we now have our very first little row of stitches. Sorry, the focusing on this webcam is not great, but we have like a little row of stitches. And then we just keep doing that until we have the sock, right? Well, I did say there'd have to be some shape in here. So I'm going to put the full slides up available on uh, probably on Twitter so people can see because I've actually got an entire pattern um, if you'd like the easy way to get started with sock knitting. Uh, well, you have to have just have my hands. Um, so we cast on using this particular technique. And let me tell you, I learn knitting completely um using youtube videos they are amazing at getting started with knitting like 100 youtube knitting teachers have saved my entire life um so we cast on a number of stitches 
we add a stitch marker so we know we're starting. And then we knit a toe. Now, this is the pattern for a toe. But essentially, what we make is like a wedge shape. And we keep on increasing until we have the number of stitches we want. And how do we know we've got the correct number of stitches? Well, we put it around our fake foot. And that sock knitting is just put it on your fake foot. Um, and then after we've kind of done our toe and it fits and it fits over it, snug is okay with knitting because um, it will stretch more lengthways. So, uh, so here is another piece of knitting. This is a baby jumper, by the way, very cute. Um, so knitting doesn't stretch very well in this direction, but stretches a ton in this direction, right? Like knitting will stretch a lot. Oh, this yarn I got, this is, I actually made a blank out of this yarn. So I have quite a lot left over. Um, so you repeat, like you can make it whatever size. Um, so you can repeat row two and three. So just increase it and then make it a little bit bigger. If you're worried about sizing, just keep on checking it. That is the point of the fake foot. You just keep on checking it. And then when it works, you know, you've reached the right, correct size. And then you knit a tube. Yep, that's it. You knit a big long tube until you're happy with it. This takes a while. This can take like a good few days, like over a week to knit a big long tube. It's great for sitting in front of the television though. Like you sit in front of the TV with your knitting, you just sit and chill. Or for me, I sit in front of like YouTube and sit and knit. <laughs> I spend a lot of my time like listening to conferences, like I was making the baby jumper um before I got started and before I was invited into the green room so um it takes a while and then you know you just keep on checking it and once you get to the heel of your fake foot that's when you've got to the correct number of like the correct length and you knit a heel and the heel is the hardest part now there is a great heel called uh fish lips kiss but the theory is you make a sock in the middle of a like you make a toe in the middle of your sock and that is what a heel is. Like a heel is nothing more than that. Um, and you basically, this is kind of confusing, um, but you essentially knit one less stitch each line, which creates kind of diagonal. And then you knit one more stitch, which creates the opposite diagonal. And then when you put that together and fold it up, because this is two dimensional, this is a three dimensional piece, it turns into a heel and magic. Um, but then you go back to the tube. And again, the tube takes a long time. And you knit for when you're happy. I knit when I reach about the same length as my foot. That's my kind of gauge. And then you make a cuff. So that is a knit one, pearl one, and it makes a stretchy piece of fabric. Looks like this. It makes like a like, like that nice stretch for the top. And finally, um, this is what sock knitting will turn you into because you will only make one. The second hardest part of making a sock is making two of them. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I'll happily take any questions. Yeah, we have some questions for you. So let me start out with some bug bounty questions. So first, first of all, Ark asks, um, I often get questions about training from in people who are interested in bug bounty hunting, asking about hack the box and, and like, I tell them about bounties in the community and there's more incentive to learn. Am I making a mistake in suggesting the hack the box route as a way to train people to do bug bounty hunting? Um, no, I don't think so. Like bug bounty is never as simple as like the one solution that will find you bugs and the one learning resource that will find you bugs. So I don't like any learning resource is good. And a lot of people don't use bug bounties as a way to make money. They learn it because it's one of the few ways you can get like actual like pen testing experience where you're like at university, like I, like I was like, like a year ago, right? Like I didn't have the opportunity to go and get a job in pen testing because I was a student. I still had the rest of a degree to finish. So I don't think it's as simple as saying, this is the correct answer. This is not the correct answer. I do think people shouldn't pay for it though. I think you should stick to free resources until you're absolutely sure it's what you wanna do. Okay, great. Um, also, somebody asked about knitting. Uh, what what knitting, knitting needles should they start out with? Um, so I would start out with bamboo 
it's very, very grippy. So the stitches won't fall off the ends, which is one of the most difficult things to do when you first start out is like the stitches just tend to slide around until you kind of get used to the feeling of them. Um, you can get what's called bulky yarn and that is like really thick yarn. You can make like a nice little hat as your first project. So my recommendation is bamboo needles, but honestly go to your local yarn shop, say, hi, I'd really like to learn how to knit. And you will have people falling over themselves offering to help you because we as knitters very much realize that knitting is not a very popular hobby anymore. And we love sharing it. That's, like we genuinely love talking about knitting. That's fabulous. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with so many of us. Um, there was one more question from a bunch of people, which is, is crocheting also acceptable? And can we make socks by crocheting? You can make socks by crocheting. Um, I, I can actually crochet as well. I have crocheted myself in a blanket, though I am not. Uh, the, the term is bistitual, if you if you can do both knitting and crocheting. Uh, I'm not quite bistitual, I can crochet. And I actually use crochet quite a lot in, in uh, knitting, like to do the top of my little baby jumper, the top had to be crocheted. So uh, yes, you also can crochet socks. Uh, if you go into Ravelry and just look at socks, but then change the search to be crochet, it will then tell you how to uh, crochet socks and the, the actual pattern. And one final question we've got time for now is um, there's a lot of focus on websites in terms of bug bounties for, you know, just, just in general. Um, are there also bug bounty programs for hardware, firmware, and software that people can get involved in? Absolutely. I'm talking a lot about websites because web is one of the most um, like accessible ways to get started. But like there are so many different options. Like Tesla's bug bounty program is not just limited to its websites. It's also limited. It's also includes things like their cars as well. Um, but it will completely depend on the on the program. If you like already know of a company that does those kind of things, and you're wondering, just take out their scope page. Like they'll have it listed. Like Apple will pay for um, bugs retaining to hardware, for example, as well. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you so much for your time.